Observatory. Sharing experiences and insights on matters of spirit, philosophy, and creativity with your hosts, Nelson and Cynthia. Welcome to episode four of the Observatory podcast. We took a little bit of a break last year between pods. Obviously, a lot went on. I don't need to go into that, but um, we're here now. And it was a good time to reset, maybe take a break from talking about things and, you know, let people be in their own zone. And maybe with some time and reflection, it's, it's good to jump back in. I uh, wanted to obviously interview people in the studio, but with limitations with uh, seeing people and, and quarantine, it made it a bit difficult. And I was hesitant to use Zoom for a while and, and the quality of the audio, but, you know, it's no big deal over that. And we're going to dig into it. So the next interview, um, we've got Ish Butler of Shabazz Palaces, Diggable Planets, Knife Nights. And yeah, it's a great honor to speak with him. We cover a lot of topics. We get into some philosophy, consciousness with creativity, discipline. We talk about history with music and diggable and Shabazz, finding new sounds and, and committing to finding new grounds as an artist. So this is a really special one. We're happy to be back. Sit back and enjoy. Thank you for tuning in. Okay, I'd like to welcome a very special guest, the man Ish Butler, one third of Diggable Planets, Shabazz Palaces, of course, Knife Nights, Cherry Wine, you can't forget that. <laughs> yeah. I feel, uh, feel very honoured, humbled to be speaking to you, man. You've had a, had a massive impact on my life and a lot of people I know. So, you know, thanks for taking the time, man. I appreciate that, man. You know, we've been... Uh orbiting around each other for for some time in a yeah. whole bunch of different continents and shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. To you, bro. yeah. Crossing paths. It's been it's been cool, man. Um yeah, I mean going back even before we were, you know, linking up, uh just a bit of backstory, like, you know, my brother was like 14 years older than me and had all the classic hip hop. And uh he made a he would make mixtapes. And when I was getting into it, he'd give me his tapes. And one of them, I remember, had Jungle Brothers, the promo, going, mm-hmm. going, into, going into Dog It. So that was, that's like always been my favorite jam. So like... Man, that promo, that, that song, that was one of the illest beats and, and sounds ever, dog. Like, that shit is... I love that joint. Yeah. I love that joint. Shout out to JBs, man. They were so heavy, like, when we was coming up, like even before Tribe and, and Daylight and them, you know, the Jungle Brothers was out there making noise and had fly shit. And then when that when the whole uh, Native Tongues squatted up, they was just hitting us with some of the most ridiculous shit ever. You know what I mean? Like it that must have been that must have been a wild time to to sort of see it happening at, at the same time as you're creating. You know? Yeah, no doubt. I was just like talking to the God, uh, so, you know, from, from Diggable, and we mm-hmm. was um, thinking about those days. You know, we, we, we working on some songs and shit and, and, and just thinking about the days when we first linked up and shit and what was going on musically, it was, it was pretty deep. And, you know, he's from Philly, mm-hmm. so like Hilltop Hustlers and Steady B and um, especially Schooly D, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Fly shit, man. That's, that's, man, I was thinking of that because one of the first questions I wanted to ask was about the Seattle scene because I feel like, especially when you grow up abroad, you obviously hear New York, 80s, LA, you might hear a bit of Philly, like Schooly D or even like the Ghetto Boys in Texas, but like Seattle, you know, I know so mix a lot, but it's like, I wanted to know kind of what, what that was like. What could you paint a bit of a picture, you know? Yeah, so it's like, to, to really look at it, you got to contextualize it in terms of the um, commercial landscape. Right. So who you knew about was directly related to who could get on. Right. And at that time, if you wasn't really in New York, it was very difficult to get on. 
Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, there is, this is pre-internet, so there's no mm-hmm. self-release and self-publishing. You mm-hmm. had to go get a record deal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Record company would pay what did nobody have home studios and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? So it was it was a lot different atmosphere. So the bulk of the music was coming out of New York where the studios and, and, and the origins of it were. So that's where everybody was coming from. And as it spread out to the cities, everybody was listening to it involved in it and, and, and rapping and doing mm-hmm. shit, but you wasn't getting signed. You know what I'm yeah, saying? You wasn't no putting that pressure. You weren't, yeah. Yeah. So out here, you know, everybody was in it. Everybody was rapping and, and you know, it was a lot of obviously West Coast influence and, and stuff coming up mm-hmm. from the wet from LA and, and the Bay with Too Short, Rodney O and Joe Cooley yeah, and uh, yeah. Ice T and all that mm-hmm. kind of shit. You know what I'm saying? And we was also, you know, because I was had an East Coast connection from my parent, my father. Right. So I would go back to Philly and New York every summer, mm. you know, to tape all the Red Alert shows and the Mr. Right. Magic shows and Lady B, Power 99 and bring the tapes back to Seattle. And then I was playing for my bros and we was getting into it and stuff like that. So but there was a group called the Emerald, Emerald Street Boys. Right. That was from my hood. And they was like um, one of them was my cousin. So they was older than, than us and we like looked up to them. They were re rapping and doing all the talent shows and shit like that. So that's how it was out here. But in terms of getting signed and shit, it really wasn't too much action. Right. And yeah. what would you say who were the was it the Emerald City, Emerald City boys that were kind of uh involving you in is that how you sort of dipped your feet into the music or not really? Nah, the, the Emerald Street Boys was kind of doing their thing, but they was older than, than right. me. You know, I was still like a young boy, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I didn't really start rapping um on my own. Like, I was always writing raps, but like to perform, yeah. I performed for the first time in high school. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. And so were you, um, you were playing instruments growing up? Like, what was the, in terms of getting into hip hop, what, do you remember your first bit of equipment or was it beats first or yeah? Nah. So my father bought me an alto saxophone in Philly. Uh-huh. Um, this was before um, junior high. So then I, I was out there. Then I came back here to go to junior high at Meany Middle School. And then my mom put me in a jazz band, my teacher, Mr. Irvin. And I stayed in there throughout my junior junior high school days. So that was my first intro to music was through alto saxophone. And then uh, when I got to high school, um, my bro Marcel had a a, a Lisa's drum machine. Mm -hmm. And that was my first time I ever like got into like making drum beats and stuff like that. And um, Mm -hmm. this is in like the uh, 85, 86. Okay. Wow. And so when you made the move to New York, which which year was that? So I left, um, I went, left Seattle. I graduated 87. I go to um, University of Massachusetts, mm-hmm. um, play basketball there for, for two years, three years. And then I left there and went to New York. So that would have been like 89, 90. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I got to stop there. I know I got to talk about basketball. Like, I know that's a, that's a big part of your life. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, what, what position did you play? How, how did basketball play, influ- you know, impact on you? Just in my neighborhood, the Central District, like all the kids, you know, played every sport, basketball, football, baseball. You know, it was like a way to, you know, you got down to the community center. Everybody was down there hanging out. It it took up your time. Each season you had something to do, get you out the house, give your mom some free time to, you know, do her thing and stuff like that. So that was just like a community thing. Everybody played sports. Then I took a liking to hoop. And mm-hmm. just kind of concentrated on that. And then that was basically my life. My life was basketball from junior high all the way through two, three years of college, you know. Yeah. So played for um, um, my high school. We won the state championship twice, you know. Shout out my coach, Al Hairston, Jojo Rodriguez. Yeah. Garfield High School in the Central District of Seattle, Washington, the Bulldogs. Yeah. And um, then I went to UMass, played for John Calipari. Um, his, his, his years after he first got his, um, head coaching job at UMass, he came from Pitt wow. and, um, yeah, basketball was my life. You know, I, I still enjoy it quite a bit. I don't Did really play, play it that no. much, but, um, not that, not that much, but you know, for a long time, that was my whole life. Man. Yeah. You know? that's right. Yeah. What position yeah. did you play? I played point guard. Um, yeah. 
in high school and in at, at, at UMass. So mm-hmm. that was my thing. I was a good ball handler, um, a good scorer, good defender, and like um, you know, just a good competitor. You know what I'm saying? So That's I love the game, and that, that those were my strengths. Nice. Have you applied? You think you've applied any of that to your approach in music, like? Uh, even if it's in the industry or are those, are those skills applicable? Most definitely. Um, we had a, a, a hard coach in high school and by that, I mean, he was disciplinarian mm-hmm. and a stickler for, um, execution. Mm-hmm. And also we were always in shape. Mm-hmm. So just those kind of basic things of paying attention, finishing something that you started understanding the workings of something so that then you know once you know the mechanics then you can play you know yeah. what i mean so fundamentals and, and that kind of shit and also being able to play with motherfuckers and and, and you know not just thinking about yourself and, and being able to work with other people and and um collaborate all of those things um i brought from athletics into my musical career yeah amazing yeah, yeah man so if there was a player now or maybe past who you compared to ish shabazz as an artist what would you who would you say ref, would reflect your music on the court hmm that's a good question um let's see i would say john morant john morant john morant oh yeah. john morant now yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. john morant yeah yeah he's wild um, yeah just his like tenacity his will to win mm. and enjoy his joy of the game. You know? He's always having fun. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I can tell from your stuff, man. It seems like you're having fun and pushing it to new directions, which is something that, you know, like my boy Ray West, we say, like, it's like there's a time b- before hearing Shabazz and then after. And uh, it's, like, it's like never the same, you know, and it's like that for a lot of fans back in Australia, like, really impactful and um, motivating, you know, in terms of having fun, taking risks musically. I'm wondering, like, when you were coming up, was there was there someone that made you, like, really, it clicked for you that they were taking risks, they were left the field? Someone that made you really go, wow? Yeah, a lot of people, really. Um, my saxophone teacher in, mm-hmm. in junior high, his name is Wadey Irving. Right fly cat you know what i'm saying he 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 was the one who first like he he taught school you know music in school and then he went and played in the bars and clubs and stuff at night and my mom knew him from her going out and seeing him play and that's when it first clicked to me like oh he he's not just he's not a teacher that's just what he does like he's really a musician you know what i'm saying and that's when it started turning for me like okay you, you can play music you know and then but in terms of music it always it was it was Clinton, George Clinton, for me, was the one that that kicked open the doors of perception. Yeah. My pop was also into the last poets, mm-hmm. specifically Jalil. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, Son Ryan and spent a lot of time in Philly. You know, yeah. my pop's from Philly, so he was up on that. And then um, De La Soul, yeah. they, 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 they broke, they broke the, the, they broke them all. You know what yeah. I'm saying? When, when plug, tune, and drop, that everything was, was different after that. Yeah. You know, so shout out Prince Paul, of course. Yeah. And Dela. And um, and of course, Rakim was the one who like is really him and, and Mo D. Right. Was really the father of like modern rap. You know what yeah. I'm saying? What we know as modern rap today, where you was throwing line, you was throwing rhymes all throughout the sequence. You know what I'm saying? Rather than sort of at the end or in the middle of the bars. You know what I mean? Yeah. These cats was and then but Rakim is. You know, he's he's the architect. He's the god. Yeah. I mean, I read his book and I was thinking of that when you're talking about your jazz teacher. Rakim was talking about how he applied his saxophone lessons to his writing. And he okay. he was thinking of like, he, apparently he was looking at Coltrane and seeing his solos. And that's how he started to think about placing his words. I know that. Yeah. I, I mean... I'm wondering, obviously jazz is such an impact on you. Do, do you think that is like, that was embedded in what you were doing, you know? For sure. Like my pop was a, was a jazz head. Yeah. Philip Cat, you know, and was a hip dude. 
really into he loves saxophone you know so always playing saxophone players i mean honestly you know when i was talking to the guy we never looked at it like oh we about to make jazz rap you know yeah. like jazz was just ubiquitous you know what i'm saying that was part of the canon of being being a black american youth you know what i'm saying yeah. you had some connection with jazz music uh -huh. So when it came time to go sampling and, and, and finding music, you was always going to have some of that around you because that's what your old heads listen to. You know what I'm saying? So we didn't really think of it cerebrally like, man, we about to, you know what I'm saying? Put, you know, do this jazz rap thing and stuff like that. But the thing that tripped it out was when we had the Japanese jazz band in the cool like that video. Mm. But that was just purely an aesthetic choice, really, because right. we thought it would be cool. It wasn't like we was making that sort of jazz rap statement, but you know it's cool yeah, it's yeah. one it, yeah it's one in the same and yeah. i guess coming to that point like labels I'm, i guess people defining what it is industry you know and putting things in boxes uh mm -hmm. speak to that man i mean i don't know how do you did that did that frustrate you at all or like how did you deal with that like coming into the industry yeah i mean honestly bro like I always had a perspective, probably due to my parents, that, you know, I understood where record labels was coming from. Right. They was trying to do what they was trying to do, Yeah. you know? And when you're trying to get in the game back then, you had to get a record deal, you know what I'm saying? And the record, it costed a lot of money to produce a record, put cats in the studio, the manufacturing videos costed hell of money and shit back then. So they was putting in a big investment. So I never looked at the label as an adversary. I understood where they was coming from. So I, I didn't really, I didn't really have that bitterness toward right. the label because it's all about leverage. Mm. If motherfuckers is gonna front you a bunch, it's like the dope gang. Who gonna front you a pack? You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, and not, and not, and not have some, some, some. The payback is gonna not be fair. You understand right. what I'm saying? But until you show that you can do your thing. Then you got leverage and now y'all negotiating on a whole nother thing. So you got to come in the music game. You take the deal you get, you work, you get a little bit more leverage. And then next time you go get a deal, you, you it's yeah. a different story. You know what I'm saying? They got to talk to you different and treat you different. So I always knew you got to work. You got to work. You got to work. The, the music business is foul, but yeah. what business isn't? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's doggy dog out here, you know? Yeah. So for me, I was always happy to be making music. And I knew that my love for music was going to keep me going regardless of the business thing or whatever. So I just had a different perspective. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so coming back to that era where you, uh, I just want to talk about equipment real quick. We were looking at that thing before. What, yeah. what were you kind of using to produce back then? I'm curious. Oh, uh, um, the Akai, uh, it, was a, it was a sampler, but it was a rack mount. Right. You know what I'm saying? It was it was a rack mount, and then my man Dave Darlington, shout out Diamond Dave, who engineered and uh, uh, the um, blowout comb, mm -hmm. and um, and then and then the cats that did um, engineered um, reaching Shane Faber and Mike Mangini, they had a studio out here in um, New Jersey, Bergen Line Avenue. We used to take out from Brooklyn, get on the trains and drive out there every day, and that's where we recorded um, the first album. But the uh, MPC man. You know, that was the, that was what it was back then, you know? And yeah. just being able to like sample and, 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 and loop and all that kind of stuff. Like you gotta understand, nobody had these things. Like you didn't know yeah. nowadays, every cat, you know, got something at home, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But back then it wasn't like that. So it was like a oasis, a utopia when you get into a studio and shit and be able to bring your records and, and start looping and chopping and stuff. So. That's yeah. what it was first for me, uh, MPC 2500. Yeah, crazy. And then the rack mount was what, like the S950 or 1000? Th yeah, I think that's, that is what it was. Right. And like, my, 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 the engineer had it, so we would be looping and shit and like recording the drums and like pressing it on the, on the rack mount, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Onto the two inch tape type situation, bro. Like mm -hmm. no automation and no, you know, uh, step editing and all that kind of shit. Hell nah. Yeah, you yeah. know? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Man, I mean, so in those sessions, where was the studio you were saying? Where you cut a lot of diggable stuff, or was it all over? The first diggable, the first diggable was 
first, the demos that I recorded was recorded in Queens, Astoria, at my man, Stacy Burkett, Michael wow. Burkett. He, we worked together at Sleeping Bag. I, I worked at Sleeping Bag Records. I was an errand boy. He had a wow. little bit of a, of a higher uh, rank job, but he said, I got a studio at home. So I used to give him money and go out to his studio. This girl would be really mad because I was always out there and shit. And I take, the, I think it was the end train, go out there, record. I did the demos for Diggable out there. The album was recorded in the studio, Mike Mangini and Shane Faber, Bergenline Avenue. I forget what part of Jersey that is. Uh -huh. And then Blowout Comb was recorded at um, Bass Hit Studios in uh, Manhattan. Amazing. Right. And at Sleeping Bag, what, were you seeing EPMD and stuff for that? Like, I used to see all them cats. EPMD, Steezo, uh, Just Ice, uh, wow. Nicole. Um, yeah, man. All them cats used to come through, man. Uh, Juggy Gales and uh, Virgil Sims and, uh, yeah, man, Will Sokolov, of all that shit, man. Legendary shit, man, for yeah, sure. Man. Yeah, man. That's great. And um, you were talking about, you know, the two-inch running uh, in terms of vocals. Like how how prepared did you have to be? Or I'm, I'm curious about that approach. Were you, like, super prepare, prepared going in or were you going in on the spot kind of thing? Nah, back then, back then I was very, like, um, detail oriented mm. um, bars and shit was already prepared you know what i mean 16 here 16 there then we're gonna go to eight then you're gonna do eight then we gonna you know what i mean everything was like super mapped out and shit it wasn't until i got older that i kind of got into more like free form spont spontaneous stuff that i'm on now but back then it was it was very yeah. detail oriented and, and very prepared going in plus Studio time costs a hell of dough. You know what I'm saying? So you wanted to prepare before you got there. You, it wasn't too much just hanging out and lounging and shit because the clock was ticking and, and the meter was running. You know what I mean? Yeah, you had yeah. to make the most of it. Yeah. 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 So in that, I did want to ask about, uh, you know, the was there a session with Guru? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah? yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe sh I don't know. Share that experience because he's obviously... So yeah, that was up at base hit. That was up at base hit on like um, what's that, fourteen or twenty first, twenty third, maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, right off of Fifth Ave, I think. They had a nice studio in there. SSL. My man Dave Darlington and his partner had a sp uh, spot up in there, and um, so Guru came up, and um, we used to hang out with him quite often. He was tight with, with knowledge, you know what I mean? And Guru was just a cool cat, you know? And um, he was always an ambassador, really, and always, like, into hanging out with cats and this kind of stuff. And um, so, boom, he came to the studio, and we hung out, and um, he just, you know, we sat in the lounge and kicked it for a little while, smoked a little bit, and then we knocked that part. He knocked his part out, you know what I mean? But we, we, we was very... I was enamored with him because I, I knew him from when he first put out his first single, him and Premier. You know what I'm saying? I knew it was from Boston, all that shit. I had cats in Boston because I went to UMAC. Yeah. So, cats wow. knew him shit. so it was just it was real ill to be around him because um, you know, he he just was was really a, a dynamic fly dude from the early days, man. So that was a dream come true to fuck with him on that song, you know, and then and then we had J Rue too. You know yeah, who was, yes, was affiliated with that crew, and um, that was just that was just a cool time, man. Fucking with them cats, legendary. Yeah, 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 man. Shout out, so, shout out, to Damager too. He's you ain't never ran into him out there in Germany. Uh, I saw him once. I saw him once. I saw him at a show, but yeah, yeah, he's out you, there. You I, every time we go to Germany, I he usually pop up or pull up or something. You know what I mean? He's out there doing yeah. his thing, man. Yeah. Afu Ra, you know? Yeah, yeah. Did you know, did you know Group Home? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, crazy. That, so, Malachi, so, yeah, come on, man. Okay. Yeah, that shit was incredible, yeah. Yeah, bro. Because I really feel like, yeah, you know, looking back, discovering that music, Diggable was like, for me, somewhere near Native Tongues, somewhere near what Primo was doing, you know, an amalgamation for, for my... To my ear, anyway. So I was, I was curious if you. Yeah, no doubt. Them cats, um, they were the, you know, at that time, you, 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 
if you like somebody, you you could be influenced by them, but you didn't want to try to sound like them because that you would get you wouldn't get far. You know what I'm saying? People would disrespect you. You it was more about originality. Now it's more like you got to sound like this in order to get on. You know what I'm saying? Back then it was like you got to sound like yourself kind of to get on. But that being said, in terms of influence, them cat like Premier is the influence of, of all the cats that that's producing at that era, as well as um as um Prince Paul, man. Prince Paul yeah. is the dom. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. He was the one that expanded. Um, not that cats before them wasn't getting busy, like don't get it twisted. But yeah. them was the dudes for me that like. It was just like, damn, this is this is really something how to play with the music. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. And like what Diggable, what you guys did and the impact of creating your sound and, and where it left. Did you see, were you able to observe like the ones who came after? Was that was that interesting to watch? Like from your from your view or were you not really you not really fussed by that? Nah, not really. You know, because yeah. it's like. Everybody that joint that jumps in the in the in the stream, you know, you 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 get hit by the water. You know what I'm saying? The water's yeah. rushing by. You you get in the flow. So I never really clocked that. Really, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, the the stream moves on. You know? Yeah. 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 Um, and talking about that era on the second album, like you know, talking about uh, the five percent, like the nation. I'm I'm curious, like the connection uh, there was, was that prevalent in Seattle or, or something that was like very New York based? I wasn't really in Seattle at that time. I had left school, went yeah. to New York, and then I was basically between Philly, New York and DC. That's oh, how I met C Knowledge. C Knowledge was from Philly, went to Howard University, but also would be kicking it up in New York. And I would see him all the time. Before I met him, I kept seeing him. I see him in Philly at the Penn Relay. I see him in DC at the you know, how we're homecoming. I see in New York at, at the Easter Parkway Parade or at this show or that show. I'd be like, man, who is this cat? You know what I'm saying? He had the high top fade. He was, you know what I'm saying? Fly and shit. So I had done the diggable demos. And, and, and back then, it was like you wanted to be in a group more than you wanted to be a solo artist. You know what I'm saying? You had to have your crew. So I was like, man, I got to get, you know, get a crew together and shit. I got the music. Let me see. And then I would see him all around. I said, man, I know that cat raps. You know what I mean? I know he's involved in rap. So then I stepped to him one day like, yo, you rap? He's like, yeah, yeah, I rap. And that's how we kind of got, got hooked up. And he's he was in the 5% Nation. He had right. studied his lessons, Knowledge 120. He was heavy with it, you know what I'm saying? So he introduced it to me. But all the cats who he was around, they was gods. You know what I'm saying? Right. Even Mecca was an earth. That's how she, you know, her. She, I met Mecca through Knowledge. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So... That's who I learned all that stuff from was see now. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I talked to, do you know Milano? You heard Milano Constantine? He's like DITC affiliate. Yeah, um, yeah, stuff. yeah. Um, um, but he, I remember talking to him about it, like growing up in Harlem, and he said, yeah, it was like in that time, like you had to, it was very much a part of like what was happening in the culture and then sure. you know, the hip hop, like, you know, sure. the, yeah. For sure. Even 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 the gangsters was 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 conscious. You know what I mean? They 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 all and we all understood that no matter what you was into, you had to be aware of your social situation. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And you you should participate in doing something to change it. You know what I mean? And that was all because of public enemy. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like in terms of the rap where like public enemy was the gods. You know what I mean? Like. They came down with the with the style of flair, but they was it was rich with yeah. information and material and pride and all that. So I was fortunate enough to come up in that era that had PE and not that they not still around, but at the time it was it was it was just deep and magical, mm -hmm. widespread from New York to LA, like PE was was the shit. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So fast forwarding now, you think uh you think the youth in particular like connected to say hip hop or, or what's happening are connected like that socially and, and musically? Nah, I mean it's different now. Like what 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 the kids care about now is, is different than what we cared about. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's just the way it goes. Things move on in time, things change. 
we didn't have the personal device, you know? Mm -hmm. So that wasn't the basis of our every thought and movement. You know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's like building my brand and, and, and getting followers and all that kind of shit. Mm -hmm. So if you take that out of the equation, you, you obviously gonna have a whole nother frame of mind. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? So that's the major difference to me. Yeah, I was thinking that today I was like, uh, I wonder back then you were able to sort of release your music, even though you guys were popular, things were happening, but like, yeah, you didn't have to go to your phone and see, oh, I got X amount of views, so many likes. No. Um, and now obviously you can, what, did that, did, you think it made it easier to just sort of like exist and, and, and not get too attached to stuff? Or were you still like, am I on the radio? Am I, you know, were you still like peeping? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I mean, you work with what you got, you know what I'm saying? And so if you don't have that, I can't really mentally compare it to a time when you do, because if you're not aware of it, then it doesn't exist. You, you're not thinking about that. But that being said, yeah, you know, like it's instant now. Everything's instant, you know what I mean? And metadata, like people want to. I got 10 likes, who liked me? Okay, yeah. how many times did they like me? At what time did they like me? Okay, what did, did they comment? What did the comment, you know what I mean? All of this sort of meta information that, you know, we, we really didn't deal with, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, it was just different. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that's a good segue, I think, into the kind of art you're doing now, music, particularly with the future and sci-fi you know i'm sure most people are familiar with shabazz who are tuning in but i mean speak to that something an album like the jealous machines and, and and what you're talking about and and you just said then you know you didn't have it so it's hard to to know about it predict what's coming but i feel like your music is so in the future are you are you considering the future more now um i think when you when you old as me and you, you witness these like really big changes, then it's kind of it's kind of um, natural to think of the future because you have a, a long enough perspective to have seen and witnessed change. Mm -hmm. So you know, thinking about the personal device to me is is the is like coming from where I came from. I had a rotary phone with a, with a long cord on it. You know what okay. I'm saying? Um, I remember when having cable like nobody in our neighborhood even had cable you know what i'm saying so the notion that you know we talking on, a, on you know real time on a computer from country to country was wild is wild but um i just feel like you know the, the personal device is sapping or not sapping it it's changing the way humans um are relate behave and the type of things that we think about um and it's, it's, it's just deep to have seen it come to this point yeah. of where it came from, you know what I'm saying? It's I don't this it. I don't think it's bad or good because it's real. It is what it is. You you might think it's bad, but so what? Who cares? It's, it's yeah. real, you know? So I just kind of look at it and observe. Sometimes I get, I get predictive, contemplative, yeah. nostalgic, forward thinking, but it's all, it's all in a cycle of thought and feeling and emotion, yeah. Yeah, amazing. So, um, was sci-fi always something you were into, like growing up, or, or are, are you into reading sci-fi? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how old I was, but we had to read a book. I didn't like reading as a kid. I was, you know what I'm saying, just, I wanted to go outside and play, shit, play yeah. hoop. But uh, we had an assignment for class to read a book by Isaac Asimov called Z for Zachariah, I think was the name of it. And that was the first book oh, I ever really wow. read other than some children's books and shit. Yeah. And, um, and then I was, you know, I was seduced by that imagining of different worlds and shit like that. Yeah. So that's what got me into to, to science fiction. And then, like I said, Clinton for me, man, was just yeah. like. a supernatural being that was able to like tap into different worlds so vividly mm -hmm. and so seductively and so stylized and so funky that 
it just I was I was down, you know what I'm saying, for whatever he was coming with, you know. Yeah. I mean, Clinton, and, and not just him. Shout out everybody that that was in the band. You know, all them cats was heavy virtuosos. You know what I'm saying? That also, you know, was was altering their minds and still able to like produce and create like just supernatural beings, bro. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't care what nobody said. That's the most sophisticated music that's ever come on the face of this earth, man. They're the best ever. I mean, any genre, right. soul, R&B, yeah. funk, like classical. Classic. Whatever you want to say, give me the cat. Yeah. 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 I mean, Sun Ra too. Sun Ra and the orchestra too, man. Them cats are beyond, man. Beyond. And them guys were straight. A lot of them didn't even, you know, mess around with no mind altering stuff. They were just always playing discipline, you mm. know, meditation and discipline, repetition, you know, just superhuman, man. Yeah. I, I read a co-train quote that like he said discipline is joy and yeah. I, I want maybe you could speak to discipline you know like how much is that a part of your process or, or the way you approach life I know you mentioned it with basketball but maybe with your newer work hmm. mostly just practicing when I don't feel like I don't look I don't I don't, I don't acknowledge writer's block or creative mm -hmm. block for me, I'm always in creative mode. There's times when I'm capturing it, committing it to a recording, but even when I'm not, I'm still getting up, walking to the kitchen with creativity in mind. So discipline comes when you're practicing. Mm. Practice, you practice, you practice, you practice, you repeat, so that when you do get loose enough and relaxed enough to create and want to commit it to tape, now you're just playing. You know what I mean? You're just playing. Yeah. You're out there like Jordan, throwing, you know what I'm saying? Throwing the ball around your back, dribbling between your legs, doing all kinds of creative things at the spur of the moment. So that's like, like that's what he, to me, he was saying discipline is joy. Like, it's the ultimate, the true joy, you know, yeah. not something manufactured or installed in your mind, but it's, it's, it's a self-generated energy that yeah. is, is pure and true. You know? Amazing, amazing, man. And yeah. I mean, as a someone creative or someone listening who's creative, you talk about always being creative. And like, I think uh, some people, you know, I speak to definitely have a tough time maybe balancing work and and creativity. Or or how do you how do you allow yourself? Like, is there a meditation? Do you meditate? Is there is there a way? Or is there a mantra or something you tell yourself to or approach that allows you to always be in a creative state you know mm. it's just through training your thoughts right um because when you when you become an adult you know it's a lot of responsibility that you have mm. you know you got to maintain your bills you got to take care of your responsibilities that that have arisen from some of the choices that you made mm. so you live in America or in a capitalist society, you, you got to get money. You know what I'm saying? So that sort of childlike view of life where you just like, oh man, it's raining out. That's crazy. Water's falling from the sky. But when you got responsibilities and shit, you, you're not looking at life like that. You're like, man, man, I got to go do this, do that, man. Fuck, it's raining. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you, 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 you move out of the childlike way of observing that life into not even noticing life no more. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that's how you really stub and stunt your creativity. So you got to train yourself to handle your responsibilities, but never take the rose colored glasses off your eyes when looking at the amazing uh, mysteries that's happening at all times all around yeah. you. And if you can tap into that and teach yourself to do it, you can help yourself be creative more, you know? Incredible, man. That's great advice. Yeah. So in that, in that respect, are you kind of like every day, every day you go into to practice, you know, without giving away too much sauce, but I'm just yeah, yeah. curious. Are you like every day you're like, I'm going to practice or let me make something or write? Well, I'm, 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 I'm going to go through rote skills, piano scales, mm. chords, fingerings, Mm -hmm. I'm gonna try to learn something new. I'm gonna I'm try to move my body to exertion. Yeah. At some point, 
and um, try to, you know, eat well, yeah. get some sleep, eliminate stressful shit. You know yeah. what I mean? But, um, and also too, you know, music, you, you could be like, there's music and then there's my life. Mm. To me, it's all the same. Right. You know? Right. So just try not to have those borders and, um, and trying to fulfill every day with some practice, man. You know? Yeah, amazing. And, and making, making myself do something that I might not have volunteered to do. You feel yeah. me? Yeah. Yeah, that's that that's that discipline. And I guess it's a it's a bit of ritual. You you've got a little For bit. Sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. For sure, because yeah. um my coach used to say you you never you never regret exercise. You never regret practice. You feel me? Mm. And what he was basically saying was you might not want to do it, but after you're done, you never look back and be like, man, I wish I hadn't worked out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, boom. You always feel good. You always exactly, feel good. exactly. So, I mean, are there, does Ish Butler get? Does Ish Butler ever feel lazy, or are you just on? How do you? Uh, how do you uh, 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 for sure, for sure. I mean, even in this time, like this is a dang, this is a crazy time. It's like so depressing, mm. so oppressive. You know, like the whole Donald Trump, yeah, um, clown show. You know what I'm saying? The Republicans. And I'm thinking about even now with the stimulus package and shit, like the Republicans don't want to get, they're giving the motherfuckers $600 and shit. Like, and the trip about it is they acting like it's their money coming from their account. You know what I'm saying? Like, why are you, why are you blocking people from being able to live their life? So shit gets down, shit gets depressing, relationship shit happens, you know, people get sick and die and, it's tough sometimes to even, you know, want to get up off the couch, but, you know, you got to train your mind to recognize when you're in that situation and have you some triggers and some default mechanisms to stand the fuck up and get to something. You know what I'm saying? You got, you got to do it. Like, that's the difference between um, sinking and swimming, bro. Yeah, yeah. So how have you maintained this year, man? Like, it has a have you found yourself being able to get those reps in practicing, creating, or has it been quite for like practicing? A yeah. Yeah. Making yeah. stuff. Not, not, not so much, but some things here and there, you know, but it almost feels like for what though, you know, because things are so off, off. I, I find myself almost feeling frivolous when you know making um rap songs and stuff like that but it comes and goes right you know I mean? yeah but it's a tough time i, I acknowledge that you know yeah. it has been difficult and like a mental it's such a mental strain you know like living in america i realized that just the it's such a drain on people mentally and just to hear those conversations non-stop when you're walking by and yeah it's a lot, you know. Yeah, and then like, you know, they kill, they killing black people, they killing black men, they shooting women, shooting kids. Nothing really happens. All types of upheaval, but you know, the system is sort of built in. Like, okay, they they're gonna protest for a little while. Okay, we'll weather that out. You know what I'm saying? It's just this cycle of of of, of dirtiness and dastardliness and oppression and violence and bloodshed and shit like. And then like, like you, you know, cats gonna go and and even with the with the new rap, it's just like man, it's it's you know, and I I like a lot of new shit. A lot of it, but the constant murder talk is it it can't be good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It can't be good as a whole, because that much killing, that much talking to killing, that much murder. It affects the subconscious. Oh, it, it it just is, man. Yeah, it just does, you know. So it's tough, yeah, but at the yeah. same time, music is a sanctuary too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's a place to go and and sort of shake off all of that stuff, and maybe make some 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 set of grooves and, and harmonies and, and vibrations that switch that yeah switch that trajectory up too. You know what I'm saying? So. 
everything is yin and yang, bro. For real. You know? So do you set are you setting intentions with your music? Are you trying to you're trying to uplift? Is is that is that part of it? I don't I never been that cerebral. Okay. Or that or that um that I've, I've never had that talent, you know, to um intend on the music to do a certain thing. Now I go into it with the intention of making something that's real and true and that I worked hard on and played hard on, but I do like when motherfuckers can do that kind of like intention based creativity. That's that's another level to me. You know what I'm saying? Like a Solange or something like that. You know what I mean? Like where they go into it with intention and then realize that you know, and it spreads out in that way too. Like that's next level shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Um. So talking about talking about P funk, uh, you know, obviously massive fan of P funk, and I feel like that with the worlds they made, like Aqua Boogie or or like uh, Funk and Teleki or any of these concept things. I mean, are just so ill that I, I do see that in something like Jealous Machines and the, and, and where the worlds you make, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. You know what I mean? That you're a P-Funk, like. Yeah. yeah, like I'm sure like myself and a lot of other cats have like reached for that, for that, you know, and, and got someplace not quite there, but that's the like, that's the holy grail of, of it all, man. Yeah. Like you know, the P-Funk stuff and the, and the and Prince too, you know what I mean? And, and Sunrod too, man. Like them cats, man. Yeah, I just went to Paisley Park earlier this year. Nice. It was crazy. Just like yeah. yeah, I went there one time. Yeah, really? Did you play? Yeah. You... Nah, so you talking about you went to Paisley Park like out outside of Minneapolis in the, yeah, the studio. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I went there one time. I was doing a remix uh for this group called the Dream Warriors. You ever heard of the Dream Warriors? Yeah. They're from out of Toronto. Um, okay. And I was doing a remix for them and, and, and I did it at Paisley Park. Wow. And I was in there uh, in one of the studios and stuff, but the cats took me around and um, took me to like this room he had where he had his gold records and shit and a couple different places. He had like a, a clothing factory kind of in there where people were like making his clothes. Yeah. And at the time when I was there, um, one of the, one of the movie studios had rented out his soundstage and had built like a neighborhood, a working neighborhood that so they could shoot a movie on his soundstage and shit. He wasn't there when I went, but wow. I was listening to his, like his engineers and shit, telling stories about him and shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, man. He's the, he's the Don too, though. You know what I mean? And I feel like coming from, I came from like a smaller town in Australia, a smaller city. For me, it was super inspiring to see someone from, Minneapolis, not not New York or LA, and then again to be outside of Minneapolis, this guy has created this world in there. Do do you feel some way about that with Seattle? Is is there like, a, have you ever felt like Seattle's had an impact, like coming from somewhere that's not one of the major zones? You know, I think so. I mean, when you look at like the funk scene here with like the, the, these like these cats like different groups like if you check out this on um, compilation called Weedle's Groove uh-huh it's like the funk story in Seattle heavy cats um even Kenny G like cats laugh at Kenny G like he's a joke and shit but he's not yeah he's a virtuoso he came up you know what I'm saying really as only one of the only white cats that was really accepted as playing with the with the brothers in the bands and shit like that there's a dope documentary on okay. Seattle funk that's dope but then you gotta think Jimi Hendrix is I went to high same high school as Jimi Hendrix, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So in terms of influence, forget it, you know what I'm saying? Then also my high school, Garfield High School, the auditorium is Quincy Jones Auditorium, because he went to Garfield too, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So again, influence there, forget about it. But in terms of um the new generation, I mean, you know, from this area. You got grunge music and shit, Kurt Cobain, Alice in Chains, all them type of cats. So Seattle really do, we do our thing. Yeah, you know I mean, I, I feel like it's a, a story. Yeah. You know, and, like, and we do our thing in our own way. Like, 
we never got big, super known and shit like New York, but amongst, you can ask motherfuckers in New York about Seattle people and they know for they forever. Know. I mean, musicians, uh, writers, and, and singers, and all that kind of stuff. So we've always been um, heavy. Yeah. Know, man. Game, not necessarily on the top, but always in the essence of it. You know? Forever, of course. I mean, thinking of that, um, like you're talking about Kurt Cobain, and I guess there's obviously sub pop and, and the um, like shoegaze music. Like a lot of my yeah. friends back home love yeah. shoegaze. I we made it. We, Oh, you do. That makes sense. Yeah. We made a meme. You know the Arnold Schwarzenegger and Carl Weathers and Predator, like the the hands together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did one that's like shoegazers and hip hop heads, and then Shabazz Palace <laughs> is in the middle. <laughs> oh, that's, I, I gotta see that, man. I'll send me that, bro. Yeah, I'll send it. <laughs> that's dope. <laughs> um, but it's like, yeah, I've got homies back home who play in shoegaze bands. They're not particularly hip hop heads, but they love Shabazz, you know. And obviously the vocals, it's just like blows your mind what you're doing vocally. Like, I, I just want to know where were you at? What were you checking? What were you buying pedals? What, how did it sort of, how did you take it that, that place, man? So my bro, Thaddeus Turner and his brother, Gerald Turner, you seen Diggable, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they, they're the guitar player and the bass player in, in Diggable band. Right, they also right. were in Cherry Wine with me. So they my they my my, my older homies. Uh -huh. Virtuoso's bass player, guitar player. Dad taught me how to play guitar. Um, set me on the road to playing. Um, and I liked him. I liked his music. And then I seen a group. I moved back to Seattle from New York in, I don't know, maybe like, oh, three or four or something like that. And I seen this group called... Um, the Helio Sequence. You ever heard of the Helio Sequence? No. Anyway, it was two cats, a drummer and a guitar player and a singer. And I seen them just at these little clubs and shit. I used to just be hanging out. I, saw, I caught them one night on the Humbug. And they were the most influential to Shabazz Palaces in terms of approach, what was possible, Mm -hmm. and changing my sort of aesthetic in the way that I was um, into production. Them, Animal Collective. Wow. I went to go see them. Didn't know who they were. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I just was at this club one night, ended up wandering into the, the space. You know, it would be a bar and then like a performance space. Yeah. I was in there having some drinks. I ended up wandering in and it was Animal Collective performing. This is in like maybe, maybe 07 or 06 mm -hmm. or something. I don't even know. Early. And I was just like, man, come on, man. what is this shit? You know what I'm saying? Like, blew my mind. So that that was what I was really listening to back then. Now, mind you, I'm always listening to hip hop and everything. That's my foundation. But in terms of production yeah. and approach, uh, the Helio sequence and um, Animal Collective. And then I was listening to a lot of shoegaze too. Um, I had my man Blood had turned me on to uh, My Bloody Valentine. Yeah. And um, I was really listening to Sonic Youth, Washing Machine album, like uh, yeah, all that shit. You know what I'm saying? Like I did, I missed all of it when it came out. Right. So I'm yeah. I'm going back and finding out about it now. You know, yeah, at yeah. that time. So yeah, that kind of shit was was turning me on. Yeah. So a step before that, Cherry Wine. I need to talk about that album, man. Like, what what space were you in there? Obviously, you would. It was a. It was still like I see on the sleeves, like Diggable Presents, but it was a departure for sure. I saw on a 12 inch, that 12. Yeah, that's a trip. Well, like I said, I had come back to Seattle. Yeah. I saw my man Thaddeus played in this group called Mach Tube. Okay. And uh, Mach Tube was Thaddeus um, and this guy named Reggie Watts, who's like, he's on, you know, that guy James Corden. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Reg was living in Seattle. They had a group called Mach 2. Him, uh, this cat Daniel, I think was his name on keyboards. Uh, the brother on drums is cold. I forget his name right now. But I went to go see them at the Sky Church. Mm -hmm. um, and they, I was like, man, this shit crazy. You know what I'm saying? It was like a kind of rock hybrid. Reggie could really sing good. So I met that. I knew him from the hood. Then I was like, man, I want to start playing guitar. So Cherry Wine was really... Yeah. My like um, guitar 
intro days when I was really into guitar music and shit like that. How long had you been playing guitar at that point? Um, maybe like a year and a half. Right. Damn. That's dope. Straight yeah. into it. Like, you must have been fired up, man. I was. <laughs> I was. <laughs> <laughs> that's dope um, yeah. so that feels like the genesis in some ways of Shabazz right Cherry Wine for sure yeah. for sure I mean I don't see it directly like that but at the same time it is because it is you know what I'm saying like it yeah, was the stage yeah. before that you know yeah, yeah. and then I met Tendai like so me and Die. He knew my girlfriend at the time. He he wanted me to get on a rap song of his. Mm -hmm. So uh, I told him, man, I don't really rap no more. You know what I'm saying? He was like, oh, okay. And then um, man, he kept asking me, kept asking me. So finally I was like, all right, I I'll rap. Now at this time, I still had equipment at home. was always making hella rap songs all the time. But okay, so you were I, still I, I thought I was too old to make music commercially again. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm too old for that, you know? But it was still my passion, so I was making it then. And all the songs that was on the two EPs that was put out before the Black Up was songs that I made at my house, but I, nobody heard them. And wow. then Tendai used to always tell me, man, you gotta make music, you should be making music. And I, I told him, man, I don't do that no more, you know what I'm saying? And then one day he got, he kept asking me and I got upset. I was like, man, dude, I make music, okay? <laughs> Leave it alone, basically, you know? He was like, let me hear it. So then when he heard it, he was like, you got to put this out. You know what I mean? So yeah. that's kind of how that Shabazz got started. Thanks to Tendo. And he, he played in Beta and he played Congress and that, but we had never made music together, nothing like that. But um, So he layered on those first two EPs? He, would, he added layers? No. I think he's on, well, he's, he's on Blasted playing in Beta. Yeah. But I think that's it. I think that's just that. Interesting. So what, what gear were you making? I'm going to get a little bit geeky for the head. Yeah, I yeah. want to get there. Yeah. Were you like SP? Was it, what were you making the beats on for, for that? Uh, yeah, NPC 3000. Okay, crazy. Yeah. I've had that now for hella. And that was what I had. And then I was running it into Pro Tools. Okay. Uh, and... um. Yeah, that was pretty much it. I didn't get Ableton. Yeah, I didn't get Ableton until before Black Up. Right. Yeah. And that changed your approach? Ableton. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that rocked my whole world, man. You know? Yeah. And I got I got that game from King Brick. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. He was like, bro, you don't got Ableton? I'm like, what? He was like, man, come on, man. Step into the new world, kid. <laughs> nah, but um, yeah, he gave me that game. And so, um, yeah. So when you... So, 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 NPC um, and uh, Pro Tools, that was pretty much what was on the first two EPs. Right. Yeah, amazing. And then using... So you said in Diggable you were kind of like structured. Were you still structured in in the first two eps or by that time you had sort of abandoned that and was it more like yeah it was gone by then it was gone yeah, yeah. but it was yeah. good that i had it for a foundation though but it was right. it was gone yeah. like learn to unlearn. yeah yeah it was it was all sun raw like i wanted to catch the explosiveness of the moment you know not in plan really that i didn't i didn't think nothing was there in the plan it had to be um on the on the, on the lightning edge you know what i'm saying that's what i wanted to hear amazing on into the unknown like that's yeah. that's how it feels but it's like yeah. to me you can i mean obviously the music you put out the discipline is, it's like you're saying it's kind of like jordan like you know you've you've built that muscle to the point where you are able to like free form a little yeah and that was the cool thing about um playing with Tendai really was that when we would perform, we would perform songs off the album and stuff, but we probably made up 40% of the show every night. You know what I mean? Just making up songs, making up grooves, interludes, segues, you know what I mean? And that was the fun part to me. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, that's something I feel like working with bands uh, that more recently, I find that a lot of it is kind of like done on stage and then they, they look at it afterwards and go, what worked live? Yeah. Uh, okay, we'll put that to the record. Whereas sometimes hip hop, I feel like sometimes can be the other way. Like yeah. the, the record's made and then you do it live and it's like, where do you change it from there? So. Yeah, and now cat nowadays cats just put the record on and perform like at the on the yeah. top levels in the stadium, guys and shit like that. They just put the record on and just talk over top of it and shit. You know what yeah. I mean? That's crazy to me, man. Yeah, yeah. With the vocals on. On <laughs> <laughs> just like, damn. At a stadium show and shit. You know what I'm saying? Arena joint. I'm like, it's it's a whole new world right now, man, with that shit, but yeah. Yeah, it's a whole new world. I mean, so you put out those two. I mean, tell me if you got a bounce or anything, man. Like, I know I'm taking mm -hmm. I'm taking some time. Okay. But those two EPs, you did that independently. Yes. yes. Man. So, and before you were saying you weren't like, like I'm not rapping. I mean, how did you overcome that, man? How did you how did you work through that and just back yourself? And obviously you had Tendai's support, but that must have been tough to come out again and, and just reinvent, you know? I mean, that, how did that happen? It was. I mean, you know, like making music is like a crazy mixture of like supreme, almost megalomaniacal confidence with like, with a lot of insecurity and, and, and questioning of yourself too, you know what I'm saying? Cause you gotta think like, yo, I'm about to rock shit, but also like, damn, motherfuckers might think this shit is whack talk, you know what I mean? So just like dealing with that and um, really Tendai really, you know, his, his sort of like hearing what I was up to and being like, it was cool, put me on the path to like, moving towards putting it out and mm -hmm. once i was on that path then my other instincts kicked in like you know getting the, the the uh packaging together and all that kind of stuff you know what i'm saying fucking with khalil joseph doing a video like then then my whole sort of like juices got from you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and um i didn't want to have nothing to do with diggable because i didn't want it to be like oh this is the the extension of a diggable thing so when i first put it out i didn't put no indication of who it was yeah. The packaging didn't even have my name or nothing on it. You know, yeah. it was just artwork. And it started doing well in the city. And I was just like, basically, me and my daughters would package it up at home, take it to the um, the stores, like uh, Easy Street and shit out here, and they would buy some. And then I would go, they would sell them out, and I would go get my money and shit like that. And what happened was uh, Pitchfork somehow caught wind of it and did a write-up about it. Wow. And wow. that's when it kind of got on, on the map like that. Family business. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, talking about that conviction, like you, you said, you had to you have to have confidence and like I don't know, speak about conviction. How important is a conviction conviction for an artist, you know? I think it's it's right up there with your instinct, you know, yeah. like you, you, you have to Deal with the self doubt. Deal with the the dice roll of, of of putting it out there in public, and you know, like that's when like you know the discipline comes in because at least you know that you put in the time and the effort. You know what I'm saying? And if it don't work out, it wasn't because you didn't do the best you could do. Right. And then you should be able to live with that. You know. Yeah. So. Um, but the conviction, that's a great word because um, it's the foundation, the essence of what you're going to need to handle the um, the highs and lows that's definitely going to come from, from yeah. jumping in the ring. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, withstand, withstand those rounds, you know, those bouts. Yeah, because yeah. you're going to get rocked. You know what I'm saying? Some unexpected a punch from somewhere you didn't think was coming is gonna land. You yeah. you better believe that. <laughs> you know, so you, you gotta stand on your conviction, man, you know, and and get back up and get back in there and start throwing start throwing some combinations, man. You know, get to get to that next bell. So yeah, man. It's a good word.
amazing. I mean, yeah, I think that's something, particularly for Ray, like Ray West, my, my guy. Yeah, shout out with. Ray, man. Ray, Ray, I, I haven't never met him, I don't think, right? Nah, nah. But uh, he, he, he always keeps up with me, man, send me cool shit and... Even you too, man. I, I I put a couple shits down. We gonna we gonna do some stuff together. But it's like I like this world where people like meet up, commuse, exchange, and like it's like an ongoing conversation. It's like a wave. You know what I'm saying? I, I like being on that wave. It, that's a part of the new world and the new era that I really fuck with. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, it's amazing. I yeah. mean, Ray, Go ahead. Oh, what was you gonna say about him? No, I mean, building on that, that, I mean, Ray just hit me up on Twitter like 10 years ago. And it's like, you know, I, I had supported AG on tour in Australia and then Ray had heard and then he was like, you want to do something? And it's like 10 years later, we're, we've done so much. It's like, that is the beauty of like these phones. You know what I mean? No like doubt. things no can doubt. spark, you know? Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, but Ray, obviously, you know, he wouldn't mind me saying he's a little bit older. He's been doing making hip hop for a long time. I know you're an inspiration because how do you stay at the cutting edge, man? It's just like mind blowing to us. Like, especially an artist to achieve so much with Diggable. I mean, you have a Grammy. It's like most people would lean on that and just like, that's it. But it's like the ultimate, it's like the rebellion, you know, you're like the, the rebel out there and have just like, yeah reshaped reshaped um a sound and it's like it's inspiring because it's i mean i'm getting i'm 30 and it's like some people give up at 30 but to know that you can still have these levels like how do you how does it happen man i don't know man it's a bro it's a broad question i know but i appreciate that um i don't know i don't know um I really, I really, I really love the vibration of music. You know, like I can't think of anything else to do, really. You know, um, and also I don't look at fame, fortune as the as the sort of measure of my success. I look more towards comfort, mm -hmm. relaxation, mm -hmm. freedom. Mm -hmm. You know. So I don't get disappointed. Like I remember people say, you know, um, blowout cone was a flop and it was because it didn't sell as much or it didn't have that hit on it. But I always liked it. And I always liked it as an accomplishment that, that, that I, I made and that, that the crew made and that we made, you know, so that's just the perspective of it. You know what I'm saying? So always looking for the next groove really, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I'm, I mean, Blowout Comb is my favorite of the Diggable. I just like that sound you were doing. And I watched that unsung uh, documentary, you know. It's like, it's dope, but like I thought it was interesting. Sometimes the narration can be a little funny and it was like dramatizes things a little bit. You know, the right. TV one. Right. And right. yeah, I guess like you know talking about the future you seem like someone who yeah isn't i mean obviously you can talk about your past but you are someone who seems to be so in the moment and present like is that some or even the future do you think is this like a focus creatively to not harp on the past because i know guys who are traditional hip-hop 90s heads <laughs> yeah i mean it's just like frustrating sometimes because you know, they're stuck in the wind a little bit. And that's cool. They like what they like. They might love Diggable, but maybe Shabazz is a bridge too far. Yeah, so like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I run into that a lot. Yeah. How do you, how do you deal with that? How do you navigate that? You know? I mean, it's like, I feel them. You know what I mean? Yeah. I personally don't want to be, I consider it being stuck if you're like in a certain period of time or a certain period of your life mm. and don't get out of it or move out of it that that's being stuck to me but another person's perspective is like nah like i that's my foundation and i'm staying there you know what i'm saying so i get it you know what i mean i don't trip like if, if somebody don't like my my music 
even my family members or my close friends, like it's a very intimate thing. Not everybody mm -hmm. gonna get into it, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it doesn't yeah. really bother uh, me that much when people don't really get it or aren't into it and stuff like that. I, I'm not really tripping. But um, yeah. and a lot of times people, when they criticize your music, like you gotta listen to them, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because if you're making it commercially, then if somebody listens to it and they got an opinion, you got to listen. You don't always got to agree. But a lot of times, depending on who they are, they might have some jewels in there for you to, you know what I mean? Take yeah. from it. I listen to motherfuckers that critique um, my music and try not to listen to the people that that, that um, praise it that much, too. You know what I'm saying? I, yeah. I, I really don't try to look back too much, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I feel that. Yeah, that you could get addicted to that. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, there's whole, like, there's whole industries built on that, you know? Like, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, like, you don't want to really get into reading the comments and shit too much, man. No, yeah, no. Nah, man. <laughs> That's, young artists need to hear that, I think, massively, you know? Like, I like, it seems like you're unattached. Would you say you try and be unattached? Like, you're doing the work and... Yeah, I don't try. I just am, but uh, but I I am because I'm old. Like it don't mean it don't. It just don't mean nothing to me. You know what I'm saying? It's not because it's not meaningful. I get it. If you come up in that era, that's what it is. But I didn't, so I have that perspective, and I can kind of like not not yeah. even do it. Yeah. So I was thinking of this earlier. Like you, you obviously features. Uh, heavily is the black constellation crew on Shabazz work. Yeah. Um, amazing. Like, and I always love hearing it. And I was just thinking if there was an MC from that chamber, like more traditional, who you could bring into the Shabazz universe, who do you think could rock? Wait, like from what chain, from when? Like, uh, like someone who's more traditional, like maybe nineties, you know, like someone, you know, say if it was Wu or, you know what I mean? Hmm. I can't really answer that one. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, collaboration is so intimate, you know, like nowadays people just kind of collaborate just because they want to, you know, like, oh, I'm going to send this to this guy. He going to get on it. You know what I'm saying? And I don't think anything's wrong with it. But for me, it's a more um, intimate process. I usually fuck with people that I've known for a while or have been orbiting around people for a while because um, music to me is just like, it's like intimate like that. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I, don't, I can't think of, I can't think of nobody like that right now. No, that's a good answer, especially because so much of this generation is built around internet. Do, do you think maybe there's a personal touch that's lost in for some sure. of these collaborations, yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, it's 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 not personal at all, you know. Yeah. I mean? it's business, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just yeah. business, man. And and everybody's like, the collaboration game is, I mean, it's kind of like the currency of the new times, especially for streaming and getting on playlisting and shit like that, which is kind of the only way that you kind of break into the the upper echelons of exposure and stuff like that you know so people are just like who can i get to you know yeah, yeah, get some yeah. attention on me and you know what i mean who can i yeah. and it's not really about there's people that collaborate with people they don't even fuck with they don't even yeah. respect you know what i'm saying which is crazy <laughs> to me man but you know that's how it is nowadays yeah it's like nba teams getting players you know john wall and bill that don't get along with them they're, they're yeah. playing yeah, I was I was watching the uh, preseason, and like I just caught a glimpse of it. It was the Lakers versus the Clippers, uh -huh. and, and somebody hit a shot, and then they showed the bench, and Montrez was like cheering and shit. And I was just like, "Damn, he was just on the other team yesterday." You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Damn, it's wild out here, man. Like, okay. and you know, they be every shit gets chippy. Dudes be getting ready to fight and shit. Yeah, yeah. A week later, you play for these guys. I'm just like, damn. They probably got some psychological boot camp where they just turn dudes into... Right. You know. <laughs> shit. Yeah, that's wild. I mean, talking about intuition, you brought that up. 
one of my favorite lyrics of yours is like, I run on feelings, fuck your facts. Mm. I mean, that's almost like a motto to me. Like, I, I don't know if you were meaning it for that, but is, is are you talking about, are you talking about intuition there? Is that? For sure, for sure, instinct, man, you know? How important like is instinct me. in what you do? It's the, it's the most important thing. Yeah. It's the most important thing because that's where your true self is, you know, is, is, is in your first thoughts, you know what I'm saying? Your first impressions, you know? Mm -hmm. And you can be wrong, but it's not that often that you are, though. You yeah. feel me? And we get sort of trained not to rely on our instincts in situations, but, you know, you hear people say, man, I knew it, you know? Of course you did, you know, because it's always there, present and clear and obvious. We think the only way you express things is through language and vision. And that's, that's very modern, but that's not real. There's all kinds of ways that, that, that a truth can, can pronounce itself to you. Are you keen to it or not, you know? And yeah. I think in your instinct is where you, you can be, you are the keenest with, especially if you believe in that and you're cultivating that, you know, yeah. practicing it and shit. Amazing. So do you have, a, do you practice are you like, maybe speak to collective consciousness? Do you think there's like a field of, uh, that we're, tap, we're all sort of connected to? Is that something, is it something you research actively or you, it's just embedded in like your being philosophy? A little bit of both, but, but it's just like, you know, human beings, man, we, we, we're just here with everything else that's alive in nature. Mm. The fact that we got it in our minds to conquer and tame nature, doesn't mean that we're not a part of it. You know what I'm saying? We can believe that we're above it, but we're, but we're really not. So everything is a constant conversation with everything that's going on around you. You know what I mean? So you can train yourself to tap into that or you can um, sort of just go with the status quo and ignore it, you know? Yeah. Just get to the business of the business of life. So I just chose to, to not do that. Yeah, amazing. And so you're making you're making decisions. I mean, it's training. It, you kind of trained your mind to be instinctual and make decisions creatively. Uh, a lot of it. I mean, you're saying Shabazz is, is free form and like made sort of like in the moment. Is there a time? How do you adjust? Is there a time you need to put that other cap on and go more editing and a little more like hone in? Is that? Or like you, you don't sort Most of over, you don't overthink it. Most definitely, it's all balance with everything, you know. It's all balance, and um, of course, there's times when you gotta. Um, I would say that that what you call that cap is really the foundation mm. of even the freest shit you might do. Is still, it's still because you know how to count and, and, and how to arrange and, right. and where to put things and how to accent and yeah. how to, you know what I'm saying, uh, syncopate and how to, you know what I mean? Yeah. So when it comes time to, you know, fit, you know, let's say you might have did a joint where you, I might have just did a freestyle rap and it went on for 24 bars, but every bar wasn't hitting and, you know what I'm saying, that's too long anyway. Yeah. But now you got to go in there and pare it down and, you know what I'm saying? Do it fast so it doesn't sound, you know, too rope or monotonous. You know what I mean? So it's like I said, it's just a balance. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and with your writing, uh, like from when I hear your work and, and read what you're doing, are the sounds informing what you're writing or, or, is, it, or is it a little bit of... Are you coming up with these concepts, these worlds outside of it, and then maybe you connect the sound? Or because I feel like a lot of stuff would be sounds first, but I don't know. Something tells me maybe it might be a different case. I'm not sure. I'm just curious. Yeah, curious. Yeah. So I haven't written a verse without music probably in 10, 15 years. Okay. It's always based on the song, the music. Yeah, and now, then. First, Sorry. Yeah. Now I might have, I might think something in my head like, oh, that's a fly phrase or that's a good concept. And then I'll go to that when I'm looking for mm -hmm. some inspiration to put on a beat or something like that. But just like sit down and write a verse and then be like, I'm going to say this at some point. 
I haven't done that in a long time. Okay. Yeah. And and what about like uh, building the like say a concept thing like uh, the concept album? You know, are they are they built like sort of in that all in one thing or like uh, the jealous machines or something? Did you write that or like the book that accompanies the new album? You know. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Hmm. I think that kind of shit grew into itself. You know, like. It may, have been, it may have been a sketch at the beginning, and by a sketch, I mean a thought in my mind or maybe a phrase or something written down, The Jealous Machines. But over the course of making it is where the details Imagine. rise up, you know? Yeah. yeah. All the way up until the last minute of having to turn in the artwork or turn, you know what I'm saying? It's always like still moving a little bit. Wow. Wow. So how do how then do you um for artists out there listening, how how tough is it to like flip into like for lack of a better word, business mode or like promotion land? Like is it are you cool with it or is it could you like take it or leave I mean, it? I like it. I mean yeah. It's an opportunity, you know, mm -hmm. to get further out, you know, learn something. I always learn something. Yeah. Even about myself. You know, mm. um, I'm with it. Plus, it means that somebody give a fuck. You know what yeah. I'm saying about what you're doing. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> so <laughs> you better get out there and have some appreciation for that because that's rare. You know. Yeah. Man. So, is there a record that you know you out of the Shabazz work that really like resonates for you the most, or that all it's all part of the same family? Hmm. Or is it your latest work? Are you kind of, you seem so present and future focused. Are you all about the new one? Nah, nah. I mean, you know, it's like, it's like going back and looking at pictures of yourself, you know, like, yeah. you could look at the picture and be like, ah, what was I doing right there? You know what I'm saying? What I have on. Yeah. Or you can look at it and be like, I was killing them that day. You know what I'm saying? I remember that day we was out of beach and you know what I mean? Like it's time capsules and shit. So, you know, you could be you could be looking at a picture uh, of you and your mom. You know what I'm saying? If your mom's alive, you feel one way. If your mom passed away, you feel a totally different way about the picture. So mm -hmm. as time moves on and things change, when you look back at something, your feeling about it changes as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. So over the years, going back and listening, I don't really listen to my music um, that much. Right. Old stuff. Yeah. But sometimes you catch it, somebody might be playing it or you might be, you know, hear it or something. And it's it's cool, it's a strange feeling, but um it's exciting and it's always it's always weird, but I like weird shit. Yeah, man. I can yeah. tell. Yeah. <laughs> um and, uh, go a little bit weird. I I don't know. Have you had any encounters? I mean, your music seems extraterrestrial at times, even though it's very human and, and personal. There's obviously an element that I feel it is somewhere beyond. Have you have you ever had an experience with any alien encounters or something like that? Just in the dream state, like I've I've always felt there's sometimes I get into certain dream states where I'm certain that I was somewhere else, you know, not just in my mind, but physically mm. another place around doing doing things, you know. Mm. Um, that's the most I could say, but I believe that it probably happens more that than you can put your finger on, or yeah, or or like that than you catch yourself. Yeah, you know? I believe that it's happening all a lot. Amazing. You know? So the dawn of diamond dreams. I mean, how important is dreaming in what your in your work? Does it does it play a lot? Yeah, man. Like it's. I feel like to be an artist, you, you're always dreaming. You know, you're always dreaming up. A concept is a dream. A groove is a dream. A plan is a dream. A song is a dream. Mm. It's all something that you see in your mind, you know what I'm saying? And then you somehow have to like build that, you know what I mean? So, yeah. And then when you get to a real thing that we know as a dream, like when you're in a different mind state and then you have this sort of these images and 
and behaviors and actions, that's like the pinnacle of dreaming. But it's always a dream. Like they say, life is but a dream. That's a cold bar, man. You know? That's, I just listened to the Santana Rick Rubin interview, and he said, he was, I want to put that at the end of my album, like the da 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 da. Yeah. He's like, that's where we are, you know? It's just life is but a dream. Yeah. That's how like that. Um, all right, so would you write a long form novel? Have you thought about that? Because after reading what you accompanied with the new album, if people don't know, maybe explain. Well, I didn't write that. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> there's a man, he goes by the name of Thomas the Twin. Okay. He wrote a book that's a tour de force, an epic. It's called, You Know a Secret. It's a book that isn't like in stores or you can't buy it online. Right. He published it uh, himself, basically. I found the book and read it. I found the man. The man wrote, after listening to the Don of Diamond Dreams, he wrote that book to accompany the Don of Diamond Dreams. Okay, right. So the book says by TTT, T. Thomas the Twin. He doesn't really want to be known uh, right. as, a, you know, he just, the writing is what it's about. And he is looking to change the world fundamentally. Wow. Um, but it's a long plan. It's not like something that he would think that he would see in his lifetime, you know? Heavy cat, beautiful guy. Mm. So he blessed me with that with that piece that accompanies the Don of Diamond Dreams. It's called The Mushroom. Mm -hmm. I yeah, encourage yeah. anybody out there that if they can get their hands on it to, to check it out. It's very imaginative, modern, cutting edge piece of literature. Yeah, it's amazing. I His mean, book, I You Know a Secret, is really the the sort of foundational inspiration for the Don, for that album, The Don of Diamond Dream. Yeah, in an abstract yeah. way, but nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. and that's accessible. Yeah, hard. Tough, man. I mean, yeah. it's just tough. He only printed up a certain amount. That was many years ago. I'm pretty sure they're all gone. It's not a published book, like on a publishing house, then find it at Amazon and nothing yeah, like yeah. that. No, no. But I mean, anyway, I, I just assumed... Like with the Clinton stuff and, and your aliases, I thought it might have been an alias, you know what I mean? Oh, shit, nah. That's me going too deep into the, like... I was no, like, I understand that because it doesn't indicate really who it is, really, you yeah. know what I mean? And I have, do, you, have you written stories? Have you written, like, sci-fi stuff? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I need to read that, man. Send me, send me some drafts. I will do <laughs> yeah dope man so what where's where do you go from here bro like how do you see things changing how do you see things i mean the world is quite tumultuous right now it's like hard to even make sense of yeah i don't know man i just i just i want to see i want to be around to see things so i'm just trying to take care of myself and keep an open mind and stay you know mentally and physically fit and um with a good outlook yeah and see as much see as many days as i can see yeah man. Earth, you know for real so we, i usually we usually finish with like these five questions so okay. what's the best piece of advice you were ever given best piece of advice i was given i don't know probably a lot of pieces my mom told me when i was a kid um she said if it doesn't smell right don't eat it yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> a lot of people eating what doesn't smell right at the moment. <laughs> yeah, you can take that into all aspects of life, too. Yeah. Man. Apply it to anything. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Uh, so the second one is like the flip. What is maybe the worst or what's, a, yeah, what's the worst bit of advice? Maybe something someone thought they were like putting you on to. Mm. You could discard. Hmm. Maybe I was going on a trip to an island 
in the sun. And somebody told me that I should take them with me. Mm. And I shouldn't have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Don't have to go further, but that, that's yeah. cool. <laughs> bad trip. It's a different yeah. kind of bad trip. Yeah. Um, what what have you been reading lately? What's something good, like a book you've read? Man, um, there's a cat. There's a book. First of all, there's a book called um, Recurrence Plot. Recurrence Plot. By Rashida Phillips. Okay. I think it's called Recurrence Plot. Incredible. Sci-fi? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. And there's a book called um, The Execution of Sun Ra by uh, Thomas Staley. Right. It's a fiction or nonfiction? No, no. It's kind of like um, it's a it's a nonfictional book on the life of Sun Ra. Crazy. Yeah, very strong, man. Very strong. Very strong. Yeah. I, I would I would shout those two out right now. Okay. What's something you tell your younger self, younger ish? Hmm. Build your, I ought to build my credit up sooner. Yeah, that's like, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what happens when you die? I'm glad I don't know yet, man. I like that. Good answer, man. Awesome. Well, I, Ish, thanks again, man. For, I, I could I, I could talk to you for hours, bro. There's still like a thousand questions I haven't hit, but uh, may, we maybe hit we're hitting hit with a part two, then. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we got it. Yeah. Uh, thank you. No, bro. I appreciate I appreciate your time, and it's always good to hear from you, man. I love your style, I love your energy, man. Thank you, brother. I you a bro, man. So I, I appreciate it. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for inspiring us, you know. Right on.